the first lecture on, on these boards over here. Uh, so, we, so recall we have a we have a collection of metric spaces, and you can just you know relating to Jason's lecture, this is some kind of a collection of curve complexes uh, associated to a to a collection of subsurfaces, for example. And uh, given on two of these metric spaces, you have a notion of a projection. You can project one to another. So in terms of these surfaces, you would want to know that any two of the subsurfaces you're given uh, intersect. You know, they, they overlap. They don't, they're not contained one in one another, and they're not disjoint, because then the projection would not be defined. And then these uh, properties here somehow encapsulate the, the, what the essential features of the projections are. So as Jason said, uh, the, these projections are uniformly bounded. Okay, that's the first axiom. Um, the second one uh, is the uh, that cross picture that uh, that Jason drew. So if if you have a, so the, the the we define the distance between between two of them as viewed from the third one by uh, just measuring the diameter of the union of these projections. So if the projections are far apart, then then you know person living in Y will realize that X and Z are far apart somehow. That's the philosophy here. And and the axiom here is that if one projection is big, then uh, so the, the actual axiom that we ultimately want is that if, you know, if one projection is big, then the other two are small, the, the, the projection distances. Uh, but here, uh, for, for the purposes of uh, having a fairly simple proof, we are taking a stronger axiom, namely the projections, if, if, if one of the projection distances is large, then not only are the other two projections small, but in fact, the projections agree on the nose. Okay, so I can uh, I can draw a little picture here. This is the way we'll be doing. You know, when we do proofs, th this is how this is going to come out. Um, the the picture for this SP one is that um, you know if I yeah I draw this Y here. This is just like a little line representing Y. And if I um, if I look at where X and Z project, so I'm going to just draw them as dots. Here's here's where X projects, and this is where Z projects. And their 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 distance is, is large. So this this distance here is more than theta. Okay. Well, that implies that if you if you shift to to x, right? X thinks that 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 y and z are exactly the same. There's kind of one dot where both y and z live. Okay. And that's what that axiom says. And then the third, the the last one is uh, some finiteness that we actually haven't used yet. This will come up shortly. Okay, and then uh, what we did last time was we looked at this set of all y's uh, where the projection distance between x and z is big. Okay, and that's, that's, this axiom here says that that set is finite. And then what, what we established is that this set is totally ordered in a natural way. And, and the picture for the, for the ordering is like, like this. You have, you have x over here, you have z over here, and you can, you can uh, picture all the y's that are in this set uh, in some kind of a linear order like this. So there's y1, y2, and so on, until we get to the last one. There are only finally many of them. Um, and what happens is that if you project, if you project anything that's to the left of one of them, let's say look at y1. So I'm projecting x, uh, and I'm going to get a certain projection. And everybody that's to the right in this picture is going to have the same projection. And that's, that projection is going to be far apart from x, because, because the distance between x and z in, in y is, a, is more than k. So all of these other uh, um, y's uh, together with z project to the same place, and, and this distance here is greater than k, right? If I go to y2, then I'm going to see x and y1 kind of all the way on the left, and I'm going to see all the others all the way on the right. There will be only two distinct projections, right? That's the picture. In each one of them, you're just going to see two distinct projections. Everybody on the left is projecting to the left set, and everybody to the right is projecting to the right set. Okay? That's the picture. That's what those six um, equivalent statements said. Okay, and then we define the projection complex. That's the space PK of Y. It's a graph. The vertex set is exactly the set Y of metric spaces, and we join X and Z by an edge if this uh, set of these um, things in between is empty. 
If there are no big projections, then we join the main edge. And the goal is to show that that's a quasi tree. Okay. So, uh, so we'll have a, a few lemmas, and then this will this will come out. So this, in fact, this was step one. Step one of the proof was to 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 show that this uh, this set is totally ordered. So this was step one. Okay. And so now we we can start with step two. So I, I, I like to think of this as, as saying that uh, you know big hops don't close up, and that's the slogan for the second step. Okay, so what does that mean? So I have um, a collection of so there's a lemma. I have a, a collection of elements of y, let's say x0, x1, and so on, xk. And I'm going to assume that as you travel from you know, x0 to x1 to x2 and so on, the, and if you look at three of them in a row, the projection to the middle one is big. Okay, so suppose, so suppose that um, the distance in xi between xi minus 1 and xi plus 1 is at least k. And k is, uh, what should k be? Greater than, uh, so k is at least 2 theta. At some point, k will have to be 3 theta, and then towards the end of the hour, it'll be 7 theta or whatever. So th that's not so important. Uh, we don't have to know the exact you know, bound for k, but the k is big enough. Okay, so if this is true, then, then in fact, uh, uh, let's say the distance, then all of the, so then x1 all the way to xk minus 1, they all, they all belong to this set y sub k of x0, xk. In other words, we are, we are exactly in this situation here, that where the projections are all, so we, we, the input into the lemma is just the local picture, right? So it's kind of a local implies global. We look at three in a row and we see this picture with, with dots projecting where they're supposed to, and we conclude that this is true globally. Okay. And uh, okay, so what's what's a proof? Well, um, so when when k is equal to two, there is nothing to prove. So let me just think about the case k equals three, and then it'll be simple induction from that. So I have I have four things, and then let's just so I have x zero, x one x2 and x3, and what do I know? I'm told that, that x0 and x2 project like this, right? And I'm told that in x2, I'm going to see x1 and x3 like this. Okay. Yeah, so I'm now going to use one of the axioms, and, and it'll tell me that, you know, since in x2, x1 and x3 are far apart, then that means so this picture means that in x1, right, in x1, uh, x2 and 3 coin, x3 coincide. That's, that was sp1, right? In other words, I should draw x3 over here. And that means that the distance between x0 and x3 is greater than k. This distance here is greater than k between x0 and x2. But x2 and x3 project to the same place. So that means that x1. So it means that x1 is really in in this set. So, so this and and in the same way you prove it for x2. So uh, so we did it for k equals three. And for great, great, greater than three, it's induction. Maybe I'll I'll um, leave it as an exercise. So like if you have five of these things, then you can let's say you erase the the middle one, then you're exactly in the situation of uh, you know k equals 3 case by induction. k is, yeah, k is, if k is equal to 2, then there's nothing to prove. Then that's, that's the assumption. Oh, well, this is little k. <laughs> this is little k, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. A different font. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what's, what's important about this is the, so this is the corollary that you could think of as saying insertion. This is 
Okay, so what does what does that mean? Well, so if I have suppose I have so y1 and y2 are in my script y of xz, and I have uh, y sub k, big K. If um, if the distance in some y between y1 and y2 is greater than k, then um, then this y is in fact also in y k of x z, and it's all it's in fact between y1 and y2. Right? Why is that? Well, because because I can apply this uh, lemma for k equals four. I have I have x, I have uh, y1, I have y, and I have y2, and then I have z. And I'm exactly in the situation of the lemma where I know that I know locally I know that uh, projections of x and y to y1 is bigger than k. You know, over here is bigger than k, and so on. Um, so. Uh, Okay, and so, the, so cor as a corollary of that, we have standard paths. Standard paths. Okay, so this, this says that this set, uh, so X union, so if, so if uh, uh, Y of XZ is equal to, say, Y1 less than Y2 less than, less than Y little k, let's say that's, that's the order, then, um, you know, I have x going to y1, going to y2, and so on, going to yk, going to z. Then this is a path from x to z in this graph, um, a path in, in, uh, in the projection complex. That's a graph, right? So I'm nervous and claiming there's an edge from x to y1, an edge from y1 to y2, and so on. Well, that's because, because of the insertion corollary. So if, 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 for example, if you didn't have an edge from y1 to y2, then there would be another y, right? That, uh, um, so that the projection of y1 and y2 to y, the distance is bigger than k. But then, but then you could insert it and then that would mean that this this wasn't why why it really belongs in here, and you didn't you didn't list it. You skipped one of them. Okay, so that's by insertion. That means that uh, y one and y two actually have to have distance one between them. Then bygones. Yes, in fact, uh, so, yeah. So something. Uh, well, this is coming, but um, it's not thin bygones, but it's something close to it. Yeah, thin bygones. No, I mean, bygones are going to be thin because ultimately it is a, it is a hyperbolic space. It's, it's a quasi tree. But something more is actually true. Okay. That's the end of step two, and there's only st one more step left, step three. And this is called projections of distant paths. Make small progress, like zero. <laughs> okay. So that's somehow the point, right? In in a quasi tree or in a tree, say, you cannot, um, you know, if you have three points and the one the one that's in the middle is is between you know, the the extreme points, then you cannot. There's no path that goes from one from the first point to the third point, and does not pass through the middle point. Um, so you cannot have, you don't have distant paths, you know, so, um, okay, well, it'll, it'll become clearer what I mean in a minute. Okay, so um, here there are th th two lemmas. So the first one is, um, so k, k is still greater than equal to two theta, and um, you're going to assume that we have two adjacent um, points in the graph. So the distance, when I write it like this, I mean the distance in the projection complex. Right? So x0 and x1 are adjacent, that means they don't have big projections anywhere. The distance, the projection distance is small wherever you project. Okay, and then we're also going to assume that the distance between x0 and z 
is greater than or equal to 2. Okay, then the conclusion is that the distance in z between x0 and x1 is less than or equal to theta. Okay, so this is an example of what I mean, that projections of distant paths make small progress. So you, you have, um, so there's x0, here's x1, and they're connected by an edge. And then there's z that you should think of as being far away. I mean, the technical assumption is that the distance is at least 2 from one of, from one of the points. And then I can, I can project x0 and x1 to z, and you know, I, the claim is that the, the, project, the projection distance is less than or equal to theta. It's clear that it's less than or equal to k. That's easy, right? So uh, this is easy. So why is that easy? Why, why couldn't it be bigger than k? Right, this, right? They don't have a big projection, the projection bigger than k anywhere. But, but the point of the lemma is that, in fact, it's, it's less than or equal to theta. It's independent of k. Okay, so, proof? Okay, so we're just playing around with the axioms. Okay, so since the, the, uh, the distance is greater than or equal to 2, that means there is some y, so that uh, the, the uh, the projection distance on y between x0 and z is greater than k, right? So what I want to do is draw the picture in z. So in, in y, right, maybe I should have started with y. The picture in y is that uh, you know, x, x0 and z are far apart. This is greater than k. Okay, so what does the picture in Z look like? Well, I, uh, I can draw X0 and Y at the same spot, right, by the axiom, right, because the distance here is big, so that means that in Z they're, they're actually coincide. And, um, oh, I, I should have said uh, assume, assume otherwise, okay, so, and then, and then I, can draw, I can draw X1 over here so that this is bigger than theta. Okay, so assume, assume um, for a contradiction that this distance between x0 and x1 is actually greater than theta. We want to get a contradiction. Okay, so then I have, I have this picture here. Okay, but then I can apply the axiom again. Right? Uh, in, in, in z, I see that, uh, uh, I, I see that uh, x0 and x1 are far apart. So that means that, no, sorry, in that, no, no, y, y and x1 are far apart. So that means that in y, x1 and z coincide, right? So in other words, I can, I can put uh, x1 here. But that tells me that the distance between x0 and x1 in y is big, and that's not allowed. There are no big projections. No. Contradiction. So I don't know, is that, is that good enough, misleading pictures like this? That's what you do, right? You 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 uh, you know you draw these pictures and you you fill in what you know and then you apply the axioms and and you until you get a contradiction. That's all. All the proofs are like that. So then, so that means that the distance between x zero and x one in y is the same as the distance between x zero and z because these are the same, but that's bigger than k. And that violates the assumption that there are no such projections. Okay, so that that already means that you, if you have some kind of a path in your space, and you're looking at the projections of the of the you know of, the, of these spaces along the path, they don't make very fast progress. They move at the speed theta at most. And theta is a, you should think of theta as being a small number compared to k. Okay. Um, okay, so here, uh, this is now it's kind of the second and final lemma of this step, although, you know, there are some words I'll have to say, but um, the, th this is where we have to switch to 3 theta. So here k is going to be 3 theta. I think at some point I'll, I'll stop keeping count of how many thetas you need. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, we'll still assume that x0 and x1, is the distance is 1, so they're adjacent in the graph. And we'll now, and now we'll assume that the distance between both xi and z is at least three. 
Okay, so we're uh, we now expect more, right? We, we, it used, you know, here the conclusion was that the, project, the, the projection was moving at speed theta, small speed. Here, we are going to conclude that things are not moving at all, just frozen in time. And that's the nail in the coffin of, you know, you're not going to be able to make progress unless you come close. That's, a, that's going to say it's a quasi tree. Okay? So then, okay, so the technical conclusion here is that the greatest elements. Well, a chain is that's going to be some kind of a corollary, right? I'll go, I'm going, if you have a path, I'll go, I'm going to apply this lemma to any two consecutive vertices in the path. Okay, so the, the conclusion of this lemma is only that um, then the greatest elements, elements um, of y sub 3 theta of x, i, z coincide. But yeah, you should think, I mean, anticipating the, the, the argument, you, you could imagine having a very long path of the xi's. And you have some, you know, here's a, um, here's a z, and then you have these x's, xi's, right? And they're supposed to be traveling somewhere, x0 to some maybe xk or something. But you take any two consecutive ones, and you look at, uh, you look at the, um, th that chain of, uh, of things in between, that totally ordered set of the y's in between, and somehow the, the very last one is always the same. You, you never, um, you, you can never change this last guy. But that's going to mean that all these guys project, so the corollary here is that, uh, so i of x um, zero to z is the same as pi z is one. Right, because the, the projection of x0 to z is the same as you can, you may as well just project the last guy in this chain to z, and you'll get, you know, whatever you get, that's going to be the same for all of these x's. Right, so that, that's going to mean that, that the path cannot make progress measured in z unless it comes close to z. The distance, you know, less than three. Okay, so um, let's prove that. That one is actually slightly more complicated than, than this uh, first lemma. That's one of the more complicated proofs. Maybe I'll leave the axioms over in the point. Um. Okay, so let's say, um, so say, so proof. So let uh, y0 and y1 be the greatest elements. And suppose, suppose they're distinct. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, I can draw a picture. So I have, I have z here, and I have x zero, and I have um, x one, like this. And then I have uh, y zero. And I have y1. Okay, so x0, and then there's some chain, you know, th this y0 is the last guy in the chain. Maybe I should have drawn it closer to z, but anyway. There may be other, other things in between x0 and y0. Okay, but I'm just drawing the last one. Now, uh, by insertion, you see, I know that, uh, so by, by insertion, I know that uh, the distance between, say, y0 and z is 1. You cannot, there's nothing in between here, because then, then this guy would not be last. And so that means that uh, the distance between um, y0 and, and either one of these x's is at least 2. So I can, I can apply the previous lemma to that situation. By the way, these are the guards from the old version. <laughs> this Y is a guard. Um, okay. So, so maybe maybe I'll use a different color here to to draw these pictures on on the no, yellow is not allowed. Okay, blue. 
Okay, so um, okay, so in y zero, I see the projection of of x zero, so I'll just label it x zero, and then I also see the projection of z, and this distance here is greater than three theta, right? Because this was this was the chain associated to three theta. The projection here is bigger than three theta, and then my lemma says that if I project x one, then I'm I'm going to be theta close to x zero, right? That's by by the lemma. Uh, okay, that's maybe I'll draw it in orange. So here is x1, and this distance. Distance here is less than or equal to theta by the lemma. Right? And so that tells me that in, in y0, x1 and z are at least two theta apart. Okay, so, uh, okay, let's see. I'm running out of space over here. Let me do it right here. So the conclusion of this is that um, both, by, by symmetry if you want, both y0 and y1 are in y sub 2 theta of x, um, of both of them, x, i, z. Right, the projection distance to either one of the y's, we just worked out y0, but the, by symmetry the same is true in y1. Uh, the distance between you know, between x1 and z is bigger than 2 theta, but also the distance between x0 and z is, in fact, bigger than 3 theta by assumption. So both y0 and y1 are in both of these. Right? And so I can compare them. They're distinct, so one of them is going to be bigger than the other. Okay? So, uh, so say uh, y0 is less than y1 in, say, y2 theta of x zero z, but then uh, then but then also then also in in y two theta of x one z they have they come in the same order in both of these uh, totally ordered sets. Why? Well, because this is characterized by by saying that um, you know when is so y one uh, y zero y one z. Well, this is just saying that when I project y one and z to y zero, I get the same point. And that's independent of whether I think of this as being part of the part of this set or this set, right? So this is characterized by characterized by um, projection of to y zero of y one is equal to projection to y zero of z. Okay, so if if they have a particular order in one, then they have that same order in the other one. Okay. So then, what's the picture? Okay. So you, you know what I'm going to argue now. That y0 was not the last element. There was y1 that should have been there. Right? So the picture now is like this. So here's x0. Here's y0. I'm going to suggestively draw y1 lower. Um, because we know that y0 is, I mean, y1 is supposed to be closer to z than y0. And then there's x1 here. And uh, what do we know? Well, in, uh, in y1, we see z on one side, and we see, um, well, it maybe takes a minute to see this, but all of these projections coincide. Because, uh, because they, you know, x0 and y0 coincide because they, um, they come from the chain that starts at x0. The, Right, both, um, you know, y1 is in the chain between x0 and z. And so the projection of, and y, y0 is in there too, and it precedes y1. So this is how you see that x0 and y0 have the same projection. But, x, uh, but y0 and uh, x1 also have the same projection because, because y0 also belongs to this chain. Right? So all of these have the same projection. But that means that... Uh, that y1 wasn't, so that means that this distance is actually uh, greater than 3 theta, not just 2 theta. So it's all the same number. And that means that y1 uh, belongs also to the y sub 3 theta, not just y sub 2 theta, you know, between x0 and z. And y0 wasn't the last one. Y, y1 was, you know, came after it. So this contradicts. So all this uh, implies that y1 is in y. 
three theta of x zero z, and y zero is less than y one, and that's a contradiction. Right? Because y zero is supposed to be the last one. Okay. Okay. So maybe uh, just as uh, for the record, I'll, I'll write down this corollary that we observed already about paths. So um, corollary is that um, so if x0, x1, xk is a path in, um, in pk of y, And uh, z is uh, some element of y. And the distance in the path stays away. So the distance between x, i, and z is at least 3 for all i. So this path stays away distance at least 3 from z. OK, then, then in fact, um, if you project any of these x, i's to z, you get the same thing. So this is independent. K greater, oh, okay, yeah, big K, big K is, is, yeah, big K should be greater than 3 theta, that's true, yeah, yeah, you have to, yeah, it's always the, the maximum, <laughs> the, the maximum estimate that you saw along the way, yeah, okay. And now uh, we can actually prove the theorem, except that I have to state uh, the, the criterion. So this is called Manning's bottleneck criterion that recognizes when something is quasi-asymmetric to a tree. Okay, so the, it's a Jason Manning. Manning's bottleneck criterion. I'm going to state it uh, slightly differently than, than the, what's usual. Um, it's a little more convenient here. So, um, so maybe, maybe I'll say it first for just trees. How would you characterize trees? When is a graph a tree? Well, for any two points, you should be able to find a path with the property that any other path between those two points contains the, the, the path you came up with. Okay, if you have that, then the, the space is necessarily a tree. You know, there are certainly no loops from, from this, and then it must be a tree. Well, so you just course, you know, just make it uh, quasi, you know, quasi, the, qua the quasi version of this. This is going to characterize quasi trees. Okay, so if um, if um, say x is a graph um, satisfying satisfying the following condition. So for any two vertices, say a and b in x zero, these are two vertices. There exists a path, um, say from um, I don't know, gamma from A to B. Um, oh, I should. Uh, so there's a constant I have to. So there exists some delta greater than or equal to zero. There's some constant that comes ahead of time. It's, it doesn't depend on A and B. There's a path gamma from A to B, such that uh, for every path. Um, say omega from A to B. Um, the uh, if you take the delta neighborhood of omega, this contains gamma. Right? Okay. Then X is a quasi tree. By quasi tree, I mean something quasi isometric to a tree. <clears throat> okay. So I'm not going to prove this criterion. I'll just use it. And, uh, and then who can tell me what kinds of paths we're going to use from between two points? Yes, it's the next board. This says standard paths there. So that's what we're going to use. OK, so standard paths. So I claim that standard paths satisfy this criterion. Why? Um, Okay, so we can, I can just say proof of theorem. 
and the, the, the proof of the theorem is you know, delta is going to be 3. Sort of interesting that it's not doesn't depend on k. Proof of theorem. So use standard paths in the manning criterion with um, delta. In fact, delta is two, I guess. Delta equal to two. Um, so why does that work? Well, so if I have, if I have some, so I have x and z, and I have my standard path, all right, so here's the, maybe y1, y is 1, y2, etc., y, yk, that's my standard path, and then you give me some other path. You give me some other path, and I have to show that I, I'm coming within two of every one of these y's, okay? So let's suppose you, you have some yi over here, I have to show that this other path comes within two of this. Okay, so, uh, well, if not, then when I project any of these points along the way to yi, I'll always get the same thing, right? So if, if, the, if, uh, if, if the path omega, so this is my path omega here, um, doesn't come within within two of yi, then the, the projection of x to yi is equal to the projection of z to yi by the lemma we proved. But that's not possible, right? Because in yi, if I draw the picture of yi, I know that uh, you know, x is on one side and z is on the other side, and this distance is greater than k. So this very first projection, well, I mean, yeah, it's already there. Yeah, I'm just applying that uh, lemma to the, you know, the, the first point and the last point in the path. And they don't have the same projection, they're far away. Okay, so the, the theorem is proved. Um, now, I, I do want to say more about standard paths, so where, where these little uh, triangles will come in. Uh, even though we still have uh, work to do, we, we, have to, we have to prove the coarse version of it. Um, okay, but hopefully this won't take too long. Um, I could uh, start leaving some of this for his exercises. But you can see the proofs are always the same, right? I mean, you just kind of, you get, you get the hang of it. Am I, am I allowed to, to write here? Yes? Okay. Okay, one more board. Maybe I'll do another one here. Okay, so let's call this a proposition. Um, so here I have three things, x, y, and z. Okay, y. Script y. Uh, then, then the triangle of standard paths looks like, okay, I guess I'll write down some formula at the end, but it's like this. So you have, there's x, there's z, there's y. So it's a, you know, the color like this. And if I look at the points, so there are some, these are the vertices. So there are at most two vertices inside the, the, each edge in the triangle. So this is kind of the worst. You could have fewer. This is the worst one. So IE, if I look at, uh, so Y, um, Y sub K of XZ minus uh, the union of y sub k of x, y, and y sub k of y, z. This has at most two elements. And if there are two of them, then they're adjacent. Okay, so that's exactly this picture. 
And uh, okay, what's the proof? Okay, so uh, I'm going to take one of these points and let's call it maybe W or something. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, so take one of these points, and let's suppose that it's not on on this side, on between x and y, for example. So that means that the distance, projection distance in W, between x and y is not less than k. Okay. Um, so here's what the claim will prove. So 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 if. Let's see, if W is in there, this yk of xz, then, um, then of course, um, the distance in W between xy is greater than theta, or the distance in W between um, y and z is greater than theta. They're just by the triangle inequality. They couldn't both be less than theta, right? Because then the sum would be less than 2 theta, but it's supposed to be bigger than k. Okay, um, so let's say, let's say this, this thing holds. So claim is that if um, dw xy is greater than theta, uh, then, all, then all predecessors of w in yk xz are in yk xy. Right? So this was, in this picture, this w was exactly kind of the first point that uh, didn't, that didn't um, belong to this string from x to y. Right? So the next, the next w cannot also satisfy that same inequality without being on the because then, uh, I mean, that argument would say that W had to be between X and Y. So what has to happen is that for the next point, you know, the other inequality holds, and then you argue that all the subsequent points are on, on, the, on this standard path from Y to Z. Okay, so it's really just proving this claim. And, and the claim is proved in the usual way, drawing some pictures and, and um, let's see, so, Actually, I have it. It's always tricky to, to kind of remember this. No, this wasn't. No, I didn't. I think I'm on my own on this. I didn't write this. Um, okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's focus on one of the. Um, let's call it maybe, I don't know, P. So let, uh, so let P be a, a predecessor. So let's say P be a predecessor, like in the claim here. Um, okay, so what's the picture? We'll start by drawing the picture uh, in W. So what do we see in W? Well, W is part of this uh, standard path from X to Z. So that means that X is kind of on one side and Z is on the other, and this distance is big. This is bigger than K. And then we're also assuming that uh, the distance between X and Y is bigger than theta. So maybe it's not quite as big, but it's also, you know, this is bigger than theta, like that. And then P is a predecessor. So P also lives here, along with X. Okay, so then what's the picture in P? Well, I have, uh, I have X on one side and I have Z on the other side and I also have W here because P comes before W. And then I can also use the axiom to see that uh, yeah, I can apply it to P, Y, and W, right? So the, when you project to P, Y, and W will end up in the same place, right? So I can can write down y here. And that's it. That means that uh, 
Um, that means that P is on the standard path from X to Y, because this distance here is greater than K. All right. Um, okay, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just one more, uh, just to relate to um, to relate to what Jason was saying about the distance formula. So there is some kind of a primitive version of the distance formula for this situation. Um, so the corollary. So these standard paths are quasi geodesics. Is the point? So the corollary here is that if the distance from x to z, this is when, I, when there is no subscript, I mean in the projection complex. If this is equal to some number n, then, um, then the standard path from x to z is length um, at most 2n minus 1. Okay, so the standard paths are quasi geodesics, and, and you conclude that. Uh, uh, you know, so this is the—I mean, this is the fancy name for the simple, simple thing like this. But anyway, you can—you can see some resemblance. So, if you want to know the distance from x to z, well, that's roughly—you um, know—you can—you count the number of y's such that the distance, the projection distance to y, is bigger than k. You know, like in, in this Jason uh, formula, he was saying take the sum summation. Of, of things, here instead of, uh, you know, he was defining bracket of x being equal to x if x is big enough. Well, here you have to define bracket of x to be 1 <laughs> if, if x is big enough. If x is bigger than k, then you define the bracket of x to be 1. And you're just counting how many terms like that there are. And that gives you coarsely the distance between x and z. Now, this is because we're doing this in this simple-minded projection complex. There's also a fancier version of the projection complex that I won't get to where you you have copies of, of your spaces embedded. You know, here, we're, we're sort of collapsing those spaces to points. But if you, if you uh, to take this fancier version, then, then in fact, you would get the, the same distance formula that, that Jason was talking about. You, know, you would be actually, because it would be, you would be adding up these distances, not just taking one for each of them. OK, so why is this true? Well, it's just a little picture. Um, so it's induction, induction on n, and and then the key picture is somehow you have a, um, so there's x and there's z, and here's your, your standard path. Okay. <clears throat> um, and let's say let's say you you draw the actual geodesic from x to z. You know so. I can draw a geodesic from x to z, and it'll have the, you know the length is going to be exactly n, because the distance between x and z is n, and I pick one of the points on this on the geodesic, okay, and I call and I call this distance n1, and this distance is n2, right? So uh, n is uh, written as n1 plus n2, and I'm just picking some vertex in the interior of this geodesic, where one length is n1, the other length is n2, and now I want to draw the the you know, the triangle from over there for these three points. Okay, so the triangle is going to look like, I mean, I don't know, the worst thing, um, like this, I guess, right, like that. And then that's it, right? So now it's some, um, so you know, you know that this length is, this length by induction, this length is less than or equal to 2n1 minus 1, this length is less than or equal to 2n2 minus 1, and so you just add them up, and then you add two more because you might, you know, you, you have to count, or three more, three more, right? Because the length will be actually three, three more that you didn't see by going over the blue. So you, when you add these two numbers and add three, you'll get two n plus one, two n, two n plus one, two n minus one. I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. But you're, you also get to subtract at least one. So the, the critical case is when this distance is actually only one. Right? This is the critical case. Otherwise, you, you prove a better inequality. So you, you, you do this, but you also subtract two, because you, have, you don't have to count these two. But you have to add three. <laughs> so you lose only one. 
Anyway, I'll let you sort that out. It's just induction. Okay. Um, okay. So that that finishes the uh, the argument when uh, when the when the, you have the strong projection axiom, when the projections are actually equal on the nose. And so the rest of the time I'll spend on on the on the on the axioms we're really interested in, where you don't assume. So these. So, so I'm going to erase S, right? And um, the P0 and P2 stay the same, but P1 just uh, becomes becomes um, the, the the distance the distance in uh, in X, for example between y and z is less than or equal to theta. And for some reason, uh, I also want to, just to, to not to get confused with my notes, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to put a little pi here. This is the projection, this the original projection, because we'll have to perturb it uh, to get uh, into the axioms, the original axioms. Okay, so this, uh, this new distance is just going, going to be called d super pi. Uh, this. Okay. Okay. So these are now our new, our weaker axioms, and what we want to do is um, show that. So the theorem in this situation is that we can perturb the projection um, and and get into the situation that where the strong axioms hold. Okay. So the theorem is um, so given given p zero through p two. Um, there is um, there is a, a new set of projections um, i z x maybe prime, and this is going to be contained in in the um, theta neighborhood of um, pi z of x. Right. So the, the new projections are going to be close to the original projections. They live in the theta neighborhood of the original projections. Uh, that satisfy satisfy uh, the strong axioms must be two. With uh, in, the uh, the two theta is not going to be equal to the old theta, but you know the constant is going to be with constant eleven theta. Okay. So I, I I will start you know ignoring the the actual you know whatever the numbers are, but they keep growing somehow, and then at the end it's eleven theta. Okay, and and this perturbation is equivariant and everything. If you have a group acting, then it will still act. Okay, so so there are two steps, and the first one is somewhat technical, and I think I'll uh, I won't discuss it. I want to get to the key idea, and this was also uh, uh, I'm, you know doing it on Mahan's orders. <laughs> so the key idea is uh, for something called forcing sequences. So I want to get to that and. And not not uh, do too much with this sort of technical thing. Uh, so the first step is the one I won't discuss much more. Um, so given this d pi, there is a, there is a new there is a, a new distance. E tilde. So of course all of these have subscripts, right? So that, okay, so two conditions hold. Uh, the, this d pi is less than or equal than d tilde, is less than or equal than d pi plus 2 theta. So that's just, uh, okay, so, you know, coarsely it's the same thing. But what we buy is something called monotonicity, which in a way is half of what you want. I mean, if you think about this, uh, you know, here, here you want some equality of projections. Here we'll get some kind of, a, you know, half of that. So uh, d tilde y of x z and d tilde w of y z is greater than seven theta. Then uh, d tilde y of x w is greater than or equal than tilde y of x z. See, we ultimately want equality here, but the picture is you have um, you have x y 
um, W and Z. And you're assuming that these uh, projections on Y between X and Z, so there's X and Z, this is big. And in W, Y and Z are big. Then, in fact, uh, this, you know, one of them is greater or equal than the other. Um, dy between x. Yeah, see, uh, so coarsely, you know, uh, from this picture, you can conclude that the w is near z, right? w is within distance theta of z. But you don't know, you don't know whether the distance increased or decreased for, as, as viewed from x. And here we're saying it, you know, there, a particular inequality has to hold. If you, uh, if you move out, further out, you know, the z is sort of further away from, from y than, you know, the, from, this, from the configuration of x and y, then, um, then its projection actually goes closer to x. If you move further out and you project, you're actually getting closer to x. It doesn't seem particularly natural. But that's exactly what, you know, what comes up in, in, when, let me, let me do something. So, I mean, you should believe that this is easier to arrange than equality. It's just half of it. I, so I won't discuss this much further. I mean, depending on if I have any time left, but I don't think I will. Okay. But modulo that, I think uh, we can do the complete proof. Okay, so step two is forcing sequences. Okay, so maybe um, okay. So let's start with the definition. So what's a forcing sequence? So k okay, forcing sequence. is um, a sequence, so it uh, starts at some y, and then you have you know, y0, y1, and then y n, and that's z, so it's some sequence from y to z, and what you know is, um, so you, you, you assume things locally, but with respect to this new distance, so it's d tilde yi between yi minus 1 and yi plus 1 is greater than k. Okay, so it's it's one of these local things. So in the in the strict axioms, we you, that was our first lemma today, right? That uh, that somehow uh, this whole thing then lives inside that uh, totally ordered set, and we were happy with that. But in in this new situation, this is no longer true. We don't uh, we don't have you know the strict equality, and so we don't know that these yi's are going to be in that totally ordered set between y and z. But uh, what we want to recover is insertion. Okay, so I don't know. K here is greater than or equal to seven theta, apparently. Um, and you take uh, a K forcing. So you take Y zero to Y n. This is uh, K forcing. And um, W is some element in Y, and you assume that the this tilde distance in W between Y i and Y i plus one is greater than k. Okay, then then you can insert W, and it will still be a k forcing sequence. Okay, then Y zero through Y i, and now you stick in this W, and Y i plus one um, z. Uh, no Y n. Is k forcing. Okay, so that's a very good thing. Then that means that this will, you know, we'll keep inserting until we run out of things to insert. And this has to, this has to stop because you know these projections are big. And by by the third axiom, there are only finitely many of those. And then we'll worry about maximal forcing sequences. Okay, so. Is one of the what? It's strict. It's strict inequality here. Yep. 
In the case of trees, you know, k equals zero is, is, is what works. Okay. Um, okay, so what, what am I supposed to prove? Well, I have to check every triple of co consecutive things. I have to check that the guy in the middle, when you look at the, the d, d tilde projection distance, that's greater than k. Well, for w, I'm assuming that. Right? For this one, I'm assuming this. And I have to check it for the, for the other. So, uh, so, you know, so I look at uh, like y i minus 1, uh, y i, and w. And then I'm also giving, going, giving myself y i plus 1. I have to check that um, the distance, the projection distance to y i between these two is greater than k. Um, well, that's exactly what my inequality says. So the distance in y i, the tilde distance between y i minus 1 and w is greater than or equal than the distance y i between uh, y i minus 1 and y i plus 1, and that, of course, is greater than k. Okay. And the other one is similar. Okay, so we can insert, and so we can talk about maximal forcing sequences. So I think I'll, I'll get there in 10 minutes, but it, you know, I think the speed has increased. But I'm using, that's exactly monotonicity, yeah. Okay. So this I call large projection implies forcing. So here you assume that you have a, so y0, yn. Let's suppose that this is a maximal k-forcing sequence. In other words, there is nothing to insert. Okay? You can always uh, make it maximal by inserting things. And this has to stop, and, and then you have a maximal forcing sequence. And suppose you have a, um, okay, so here in this lemma, I guess we are reverting to, to the um, usual projection. You know, the d pi. I mean, they're within two, two theta of each other, so it doesn't really matter very much. Um, but suppose that when you project to w, you see a large projection distance between y0 and yn. So this is greater than k plus two theta. Okay, then in fact, w must be one of the, one of the yi's. And if you have some projection that's, you know, clearly, if it's not just, if it's just greater than k, then you wouldn't know. But if it's, if it's greater than k by a, by a certain amount, like by 2 theta, then in fact it has to appear in every maximal forcing sequence. These maximal forcing sequences might not be unique, but, um, but th this, this particular one has to appear in all of them. <clears throat> okay. So you could you could state the lemma with with a tilde because they're within two theta of each other, but I, I don't know for some reason in my notes it's it's d pi here. I'm reverting to d pi again. Um, I mean two theta is not important. You could you know if you put ten theta and you prove a lemma like this, then you'll you'll prove the theorem at the end. It's just that eleven theta might be twenty theta or something. That's not so important. Okay, so um, is this where my my notes are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So proof. So let's suppose. Um, that that uh, that the distance in W now. So we're going to measure the distance in W between y i and uh, y n is strictly greater than theta. We want to focus on what's happening in W. How does W see this sequence uh, from y zero to y n? Um, so you know, in W, 
I have, uh, I have y0 and I have yn, and they're very far apart. Now, and then yi's are somewhere, we don't know. But let's suppose that there's some yi that, that's not particularly close to yn. It's, you know, it's a distance bigger than theta. Well, then I claim that it has to be close to y0. Every yi you see here has to be close to either y0 or to yn. Okay, that's the claim here. So let's suppose that, in fact, yi is not close to yn. Then I claim it's close to y0. Uh, why? Well, because, because now I can, I can draw the picture in yi, and you can, you can use one of my axioms that, um, you know, yi and yn are close. Um, so yi and yn have to be close. They're not equal, but, you know, they're, they're distance less than theta. And, uh, no, not y, uh, sorry, w, yes, thank you. And uh, y0 is way out there. This distance here is uh, greater than, uh, I don't know what it is, k minus, it's big distance, right? It's, it's on the order of k, but maybe you have to subtract the theta or two because this was the d tilde distance, and here we're taking d pi distance. Um, but in any case, it's a big distance. And so, so what does that mean uh, back in w? Well, in w, uh, that means that y0 and yi are close. Right? So yi has to actually be over here. Okay, so we concluded here that then the distance in w between y0 and yi is less than or equal to theta, right? So every one of the yi's is, is close to either y0 or to y. You know, so what do we have? We look at y, we look at where y1 is. Well, maybe it's close to here. Y2, maybe it's close to here. At some point, you ought to hop all the way close to yn. But the distance between them is more than k plus 2 theta. And these guys are staying within theta of each other. So in other words, that big hop is bigger than k. And that means you can insert that means you can insert W, right? So it's uh, so find find I so that uh, you know the distance in W, the pi distance between um, I don't know y zero and y i is less than theta, and the distance in between uh, between y i plus one and y n is greater is less than or equal to theta, then insert insert w, and that's a contradiction. Okay. Because this was a maximal thing. Okay, so five minutes, I think I can do it. There are no more lemmas left, just the definition and verification of the axioms. And that's that's sort of trivial at this point. Um, Okay, so I'm going to now define the new projection. Are you ready? Okay, so definition. So we have I prime of X to Y. So these are the new projections here. Okay, so I have, I have, um, well, I just go like this X. And there is y over here. I don't know why I switched to x and y instead of having x and z as before. Um, so I want to look at all maximal k-forcing sequences between x and y. So there may be several of them, maybe even, for all I know, infinitely many. Um, you know, so take, take one and look at the penultimate element. So the one, the guy that's at the end here, the last guy. Okay? And look at its projection to y. Okay, so this is going to be a, a big union over all Ws of the, uh, the, the old projection of W to Y, where the union, uh, union is over all penultimate uh, elements W of K-forcing sequences um, of maximal well, in fact, I can make it specific here. Uh, seven theta forcing sequences 
uh, from X to Z. Okay. So this is how you get stability. I mean, this projection has to be somehow stable, right? That's what that's somehow what you know. If if I wiggle X or something, if I perturb slightly, the projection should, should stay the same. And that's what these forcing sequences are designed to do. So, uh, so now we, we need to check properties, right? Well, the first one is just that uh, what that pi y prime of x is contained in n theta of the old projection. Well, that's just uh, the, uh, the our axiom. You know, w, x and w project to nearby points just because the projection to w is big. So they have to have nearby projections over here. So for all, all these w's, all, they all have projections that live inside here, so the union also does. Okay, so that was one, and that's check. And then the other one is that um, if I have, uh, the other is this kind of stability. So this is the, the, if I have, suppose I have this picture. Here's x, here's y, and here's z. And I'm going to assume that, uh, so I, I'm going to project x and z to y, and I'm going to assume that this distance is big. This is bigger than 11 theta, strictly bigger than 11 theta. Then in this situation, I want to conclude that uh, that pi, I want to conclude that pi z prime of x is equal to pi z prime of y. Right? This is what I have to prove, that x and y have the same projection to z. So why is that? Well, first of all, so how is, how is this thing defined? Well, you're supposed to look at all forcing sequences from x to z, and then take the penultimate element and project. Well, all forcing sequences will pass through y. And if you, if you restrict um, that sequence just to between y and z, it'll be a maximal forcing sequence from y to z. And so all the w's that I get from x to z will also appear in the list from y to z. But the converse is also true. If I take any forcing sequence, maximal forcing sequence from y to z, I can also I can I can complete it to a, you know take a, just complete it to a maximal forcing sequence that starts at x, and you can never insert a new you know that penultimate element will stay penultimate. You cannot insert a new one in there, and so that's it. Okay, so I will stop here.